Hello, I'm Drew Velo Melchizedek, and we're here today to take questions from the audience and to answer them and to uh, discover more about ourselves, to understand uh, more about the, uh, the situation we're in, on the, in the world where we're transforming at this time into another way of being. Uh, some people call this ascension. And, uh, and so I'm going to just get right into it. Uh, there's a man, Shankar, who lives in Seattle, Washington, and his question is, is that there is much speculation as to what will occur in 2012, and he lists things like the, the Earth shifting with a new frequency, Earth changes, ETs landing, the fall of present gov of the government, and moving from the third to the fourth, and then into the fifth dimension. And basically what he wants to know is, is uh, if I have any insight that I can offer to those who are awakening to this oneness process and how best to prepare. This is a good question. That's why I started with this. Uh, uh, it, most of the world obviously is not aware that there's anything going wrong, even though if you just have your eyes open and watch the sun and the earth and the changes that are occurring right now, it's pretty clear to just about anybody that is truly watching what's happening in the world that there is something occurring right now that has never happened before. Uh, for example, the, the changes that are happening in our solar system as presented through the Russian scientific community are changes that would normally take millions of years to take place and they've been occurring over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, there are planets that have had magnetic pole shifts in our, in our, in our solar system, two of them. Uh, there are uh, new atmospheres forming around uh, Mars that would take very long periods of time uh, to see these things, and they happen over a 10-year period. There's an atmosphere forming on the moon, which there has never been one before, and there is now. And so there are a lot of changes. The, 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 this is not just here on the Earth. And we, so what does one do? Uh, when uh, they're confronted with the ideas that there could be ETs that are here and that there could be uh, uh, changes that are going to happen in the earth and around the earth. How does one prepare? You have to uh, first realize that there is a change happening because if you're not, if you just ignore it or deny that any of that's happening, uh, then you're not going to do anything. Once you realize that there is something happening, you have to make an inner change within yourself to say, okay, I'm going to begin to study, to understand, to find out what is really taking place the best that you can. Uh, and what this always leads to is an inner exploration. Uh, what's happening outside in the external world, that's one thing, but the cause of these things, why these changes are taking place, are really found within you, not on the external side of it. Uh, sure, you can study that external side, but you must know that it's inside of you is the source of what is making this happen. I know most of us think that, uh, that we are just a tiny one person on earth and our, we don't make much difference, but that is not actually the truth. Uh, the truth is more uh, interesting, at least, uh, there is only one spirit that moves through everyone and through all things. And, uh, and, and so even though we are in the illusion that, uh, that each person is separate from us, in fact and in truth, they're not. There is only really one of us. And, and, and because of that, when we go within ourselves, we will find that we are the ones that are creating these situations that are occurring around the world. It's not coming from the sun or from the center of the galaxy or from the earth, it's coming from within us. And, and it is within us that we find the answers to these kinds of things. It's through meditation. It's going deeper and discovering uh, all the different inner relationships that we have to the external world. And now to get into a very practical thing is that it doesn't do you any good to go out and dig a hole in the ground and put food and guns and these kind of things to protect yourself against these kind of changes. Uh, these changes that are, that are coming, if we are correct in what we see happening, are far greater than anything you can physically do to help yourself. Uh, it, it just won't help. Even the secret government who has built entire cities underground preparing for this, they're going to discover that even that won't help them. It might buy them a little bit of time, 
but not enough to make any difference. Uh, and so uh, this is where you m need to look. Look within yourself and, and first you may think it's within your brain, but I'll help you now. That's only part of it. The inside of your heart, there is a sacred space in there and inside that sacred space is a tiny space and that is the key to creation. It is the key to everything that's happening right now, everything that's occurring. And so uh, if you really want to know what to do, that is also where everything is written about you, inside of you. You have written down everything. Every, it's the Akashic Records. You, it's not only the Akashic Records of the universe, but it's your personal Akashic Records or in the, in the outer space, the tiny space of the heart. And, and it is there that uh, why you came here in the first place, uh, you made sure that it was recorded so that when you got here you wouldn't forget. Uh, and everything that you need to know right now is inside of you. Uh, you just have to know how to learn how to go into meditation and find this place. And then it's easy after that. Even connecting with your higher self, which is so difficult externally, if you, once you reach the inner part of your heart, your, your higher self can communicate with you just like I am right now, easily and directly. And so, and once you get to your higher self, that is you on other levels of existence, you can get guidance that, that no one on earth can give you better than what they can give you. And so, uh, that is the, uh, that would be the insight that I would offer, and I hope that uh, that helps you a little bit. I'm getting another question from Becca. I'm not sure where she's from. <laughs> Doesn't say. The question is, um, people that don't know about the Merkaba, will they have a chance of getting into the fourth dimension? Well, whether a person knows about the Merkaba or not, they still have the uh, seed of the Merkaba is around their bodies. And so every single living person in existence has the ability to either create the Merkaba around them or they have one around them. To get into the fourth dimension, you can die, and when you do, you go from the third to the fourth dimension. But you have to die consciously. This is the biggest problem on Earth right now. If you don't die consciously, that, uh, then you, you die without your Merkaba and you don't bring your physical body with you. And that means that when you get to the fourth dimension, you can't stay there. And you end up coming back here, reincarnating, getting another body and another chance to do it again. Let me clarify this exactly what I'm saying. Uh, in order to move consciously and to die consciously from the earth to the next level of existence, the fourth dimension, you must have your Merkaba working perfectly. Uh, if you don't, you can't die consciously. And so, obviously, that's an important step to accomplish in your life, is to get your Merkaba working. But there is, of course, much more to it than just the Merkaba, and that's another question. The other part of this is, uh, seems funny to some people, but we think that when we die, we leave our body and we go on. But that is part of the problem. Uh, in all the ancient religions, uh, well, not all of them, but most of them, uh, the, even the ancient Egyptians, or, or who were so involved in, in mummifying bodies and trying to uh, get the body to go to the next level, and the Christians that came out of that with, through resurrection, where, that, where Jesus died, and then after he died, he formed his body and took it with him. You must bring your body with you. Uh, it doesn't have to be in good shape. You could be in a wheelchair with no arms and no legs, and as long as you got your heart beating, uh, that's all that's necessary. Uh, but you do have to bring it with you, uh, because the, what the reality is, is that when you are born onto the fourth dimension, uh, it is very similar to being born here. When you come here, uh, you come from another world, you come in and you step into a little tiny baby's body and you're born out into here and then you, that body begins to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger until finally you become an adult. Well, as you go into the fourth dimension, this body, as you bring it over to the next level, is a baby there. And it will do the same thing. It is also going to start growing. You're going to start getting taller 
and you're going to reshape your body. New organs are going to form. A huge brain is formed that's almost three times as big as the one you have now. And you're going to, females are going to be about 10 to 12 feet high, and males are going to be about 14 to 16 feet high. And you have a, it's very humanoid. It looks very much like us in, in many ways, but it's a very different body, and it, it is capable of functioning on the fourth dimension. And so, um, I, I don't know if I answered that question or not. I, I, I hope that I did. But uh, you do need your Merkaba, which was the basic question, to get into the fourth dimension. And so uh, you need to, you need to re either remember it, which is possible, you could do it without anyone, or you need to get help from someone that can do that. We have a, a, a program with the uh, uh, Awakening uh, the Illuminated Heart which is a program designed for someone to do exactly that. You can go on to dreamvelo.net and look under the School of Remembering and there you will find uh, people that are trained all over the world that can help you into remembering what the Merkaba is and how it all works. And a lot of more information that is actually far more important than even the Merkaba. Okay, let's see. This one is uh, Kita from France. And uh, she says that, uh, I mentioned that uh, our fathers are from Sirius, but she's read from other channels that they are from the Pleiades. Uh, okay, let me explain this. Uh, the creation of the human race came about uh, in, from a mother and a father. This all, every race that's ever been developed always began with a mother, and a mommy and a daddy, just like a, an individual. And in our case, it started from the Nephilim, which is a planet that is outside of our viewing here, but NASA has now located this planet and they know that it's really real. And, uh, and if you go back into the Sumerian records, which are the oldest written records on Earth, about 6,000 years old, that we know of anyway, uh, there it explains exactly who these people are, the Nephilim, and, that, and it says right in there that they are the mother, the female part that created our race. Uh, the other part, the external part that came from off-planet to meet with us was the Syrians. And they were the ones that are, are literally our father that joined with the Nephilim to create the human race. The uh, Pleiades are very, very close to the Syrians, even though the distance between their star systems is great. Uh, the, the lines of energy as they flow through time and space and dimension flow from the Pleiades to the Syrians, Syri to Sirius, and to the Earth. And, uh, and so there is a, a relationship between the Syrians and the Pleiades. They're kind of like brothers and sisters. Uh, the Pleiades do have a huge influence on Earth, as well as the Syrians. They both do. The Pleiades are older, and they're farther advanced. The Syrians are third and fourth dimensional beings, whereas the Pleiadians are third, fourth, and fifth dimensional beings. They just started to achieve the fifth dimension in the last few months. It's a new thing for them. They're very excited. And, uh, and so uh, some people could see how the Pleiadians were a deep influence on creating our race. And they do have, uh, uh, they do have an influence on that, but they are not directly where the male energy came from. It came from the Sirius. From, from actually to be specific, they came from Sirius B, third planet out. Okay, hope that helps. Uh, okay, now we have a question from, oh boy, uh, it's uh, G-U-I-L-L-A-U-M-E. I don't know how to say that. Um, um, and I don't know where this person is from either, but I'm going to answer the question because it's, it's, it's an interesting question, but I have to read it because it's a little bit... He says, uh, he or she says, I have a deep love for all of us and also for all of creation. I would love to see our planet emerge in a galactic free space where everyone, human or not, is good with their individual evolution and where friendship is free for all to explore without personal agendas or mental power and interfering with human freedom and future evolution conditions. In emerging in this greater galactic community, we will inevitably, inevitably be in contact with many races whose wishes are to be allies to Earth's humanity, but not necessarily for in, uh, entirely selfless reasons. So the question is, how do you perceive us jumping in the arms of grown-ups that have their own agenda? 
And how do you perceive them opening their arms to us without, without us having any real enlightenment as to the reasons as to why or how to keep our freedom? Do you think we can secure our future sovereignty as human humanity and be excited and jump without much knowledge into this new galactic association at the same time? This, is, this question is based on uh, your understanding from polarity consciousness and, uh, and from polarity consciousness we see ourselves and other races as being separate from ourselves in the same way that we see uh, myself separate from someone else as an individual. This is again not the truth. The truth is, is that there's one living organ, organism which is we call the universe and everyone in there is all intimately connected together because there is one, only one spirit moving through everything. And so the idea that there are races that are uh, warring, that, that, or, or just the idea of Star Wars, where the, the space is just in one big battle out there fighting each other, is not true. Uh, there is, uh, the, the universe is ancient, and it has uh, uh, organized itself very much like the human body, where there are areas that is the heart, there are areas that is the liver, the kidney, and we are all functioning together as one living being. And there are races that are coming out of, that are still in polarity, which is the very bottom of the barrel of consciousness. And some of these races are still emerging out of, you might say, like childhood into an adulthood, and they haven't reached there yet. And so there's a little tiny bit of conflict. But it, relative to the whole, it's, it's a minuscule amount of things. So all of these, the greys and the reptiles and all these other people that have been kind of warring against us for a long time, this amounts to almost nothing in the, in the, uh, in the entire equation of consciousness that is out there. And all of that is evolving to a point where all of us, us, the greys, the reptiles and human beings, are all going to step out of polar human or out of polarity consciousness at some point and move into oneness. There is no choice. That's what happens. Because there only is, in truth, oneness. There is only one thing. There is no two-ness. And, uh, and so, right now, we have bodies. And, uh, and we experience a male and a female body. We're still involved in polarity. When we move into the fourth dimension, we will still be in polarity. There will be male and female bodies. But we will have moved much closer to unity consciousness. So these bodies are almost all mass and very little energy. And everything here in this, in this third dimensional world is almost all mass and very little energy. But in the fourth dimension, it's the opposite. Our bodies are almost pure energy with very little mass. Our atoms are separated by great distances. And, uh, and but what happens as we move into the four, fifth dimension and above, which includes all dimensions above the fifth dimension from there on up, there is no form anymore. We become formless and we become the universe. Uh, we literally become the stars and planets and all that is. We, we entered into that level. So there is no idea or, or concept of one race being greater than another race because it just doesn't exist on those levels. And, and then we begin to realize that there are other ways of becoming the in-universe. The uh, life has figured out so far, over since the beginning of time until now, they have calculated approximately 100,200 100, different kinds of Merkabas. And each one of these Merkabas takes the one universe, the, the one reality of everything it is, and perceives it in a different way. And so it looks and feels entirely different, but we're actually looking and experiencing and being the same thing each time. It, it, it's almost beyond our, our imagination of what I'm talking about, but this is how it is. And, uh, and so, uh, we don't really have to be too worried at this point. What we will, when we move into the fourth dimension, there will be a little bit of this still going on because we haven't quite moved into oneness, full oneness yet. But uh, uh, 
it's going to happen. It, it's inevitable. It's absolutely for certain will take place in the future. And, uh, and so uh, I know that from where we are now, it's hard to understand, but uh, oneness is really the only true reality. And what we're in right now is just a, a deviation of oneness that, uh, and we don't understand it yet. But don't worry about these other races, all higher races, and I, that's all in capital letters, bold and underlined, and every single last one, without exception, all the higher life forms understand that there is only one spirit that moves through everything, and long ago have, have moved into a way of perceiving it so that uh, they care intimately about all life that exists everywhere because they know it is their body, it is them. And so uh, we don't really have to be concerned about this. Besides, we're only going to be in the fourth dimension uh, about two years ex experientially, and we're going to move on from there to another level of existence. And so uh, all we have to do is just make this one step into the fourth dimension, and once we get there, we'll be fine. Everything will be fine, really. There's another question from... Ma Ah, it's another hard word to say, Mariki, M-A-R-I-J-K-E. And I don't know where she, she or she is from either. This is an, this is an um, there is information on the internet about new types of Merkabas, or even that now the Merkaba is not necessary anymore. For example, one of these ideas is that on December 21st, 2012, the Merkaba of the Earth will be activated at 5534 frequencies, and that will produce the pole shift. Well, let's go back to the beginning. Personally, it was, it was through me, from the Ascended Masters, through me, that the very idea of the Merkaba was presented to the Earth and, uh, and exactly how it was created. What the Earth doesn't understand because of the way it was released is that the Merkaba uh, is not as important as we think it is. There is other factors within our body that are more important, way more important than the Merkaba. And, and it has to do with the heart and the relationship between the heart and the brain. And, uh, and the Merkaba is, uh, is, a, is essential as everything else is, but it is uh, not uh, as important as we think. But to say that it is not necessary is is that is coming from someone that has no idea what they're talking about. I'm sorry to be so blunt, but they just don't. Uh, because uh, the Merkaba is absolutely essential to move from one level to another. You cannot get there without having a Merkaba, period. But uh, the idea that the Merkaba is going to change on December 21st and, and, and change its speed ratios and become something else and that will produce the pole shift, that is a, that's speculation by people. Uh, the truth is nobody knows exactly when that day is going to be. Even the Mayans themselves, who, who presented that day of December 21st, 2012, I've sat down with them and talked to them about this. And they don't know what, when the change is going to happen. It could happen from the beginning. There's a window around that date, which is about four years on either side. It, the window opened in October of... of uh, of 2007, and they are telling me that it will close sometime in late 2015, November, December 2015. And so the date when the change t occurs, that we're all wondering when it will happen, will happen sometime between now, this minute, and sometime between the very end of 2015. And, uh, and it could happen any day. And uh, Don Alejandro Cerillo uh, has said that the likelihood of it happening on December 21st, 2012 is almost zero. Uh, it could be any day, any moment, any time during that time, and they're all moments are the same. Uh, but as will the uh, frequencies change from 34 to 21 to 55, 34, there's not one living person on earth that knows that for sure. The uh, only way that that can happen and when it happens and what, what we change to and what shapes we change to 
That probably will occur, but it is a, it is a relationship between Mother Earth and Father Son. It, it, it comes from the Son to the Earth, the Earth responds to it, and when it does, that's when the change takes place. And we don't know this. Uh, it is purposely being shielded from the Son and the Earth. And so, uh, uh, anyone that tells you these kinds of things, they're guessing. They don't know. And it isn't not important for us to know, either. Because when, uh, the, when the, this all occurs, our Merkaba that we have now, which is what the Earth and the Sun are using, and it's the reason why we're using it, the Earth and the Sun have a tetrahedral Merkaba based on 3421 ratios, and so does the human body. But when we all make the transition over into another level, yeah, it's going to change, and whatever it changes to, we will automatically change according to what the Sun and the Earth set up. We don't even have to think about it. It will happen automatically. And so, I really think that we should stop worrying about this Merkaba so much out there and trying to think that if we change it somehow, we're going to be able to get to the other side in a better way. That just is not possible. It has to occur according to the codes that come from the sun to the earth and, and then to us. And there is nothing we can do to change that. So, and we wouldn't want to, because in order to move cosmically in this way, we can't make those motions alone. It is the earth and the sun that uh, causes ascension to take place. It doesn't happen from an individual. And so, um, I hope that helps, <laughs> and we'll go on to the next question. There was another question from Kita from France, and uh, she says, I saw your conversation with Lilu. You mentioned that this universe will not exist at one point, and that we are going to move from the 144th level to the 145th level, and that we will end up in a brand new universe. Uh, yes, um, I do agree with this, but <laughs> basically I said it. Uh, the, uh, how this works is, there, uh, the, all the relationships of the dimensions are separated from each other in exactly the same way that music is separated from each other. In fact, every single thing, without exception, that is in this universe is based on the harmonic of sound and music and frequency. And, uh, and the, the dimensions are separated from each other by frequency. Uh, and, and in this particular case that they're talking about here, they're separated in exactly the same way the chromatic scale is, which is 12 notes and the 13th note is the return, which is the same as the black, the black and the white keys on the piano moving, piano moving one octave. And, um, and if you look in the way the dimensions are, uh, we are on the third dimension, meaning the, the, which would be equivalent to the third note on the chromatic scale. And in between each one of these notes, there are 12 overtones. So there are 12 basic notes, and there are 12 overtones between each one of them. And that 12 by 12 uh, equals the 144 basic dimensions that our universe functions through. Uh, we are about to leave this uh, dimensional set of universes and move from this octave of universes into another one. And when we do, we will move all the way up to the hundred, not just to the fifth dimension, fourth and fifth dimension, like some people are talking about, but we're going to continue. We're going to continue moving all the way up, all the way through all of them, until we get to the 144th, and then there is a void space between the 144th and the 145th, which is very unique uh, space, and uh, which does not allow anything to move through it except sp uh, spirit and that's it. No physical object can move through this space. And we're all going to move over. It's not just the Earth, but the entire universe is in the process now of preparing for this. And they are going to move over into the next octave of universes, and we will move into the 144th dimension, which is the first overtone of this set uh, in that new world. When we do, once we this universe has completely been has left here and gone over to the other world, when we do that, then uh, this world, this universe that we're in now, will simply not exist. Uh, that's really hard to understand how that's possible. And um, 
And the only way you can really know that is through deep inner meditation and understand that the external world is not there. It is an image. It is an image based on consciousness and created through consciousness. And it doesn't actually have a reality of its own. And when consciousness moves from one place to another, it takes the images with it to another, to another one, and we create a new world, a new way of existing. And I, I know this is outside of human consciousness. I'm sorry, it is. But it is the only way I can explain it and be truthful. And so uh, 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 there are many teachings in Tibetan Buddhism and, uh, and in uh, Hindu, Hinduism that uh, also have exactly this same understanding coming all the way from the Vedas that are over at least 6,000 years old. And so if you want to study the ancient Vedas, uh, or go into uh, Tibetan Buddhism or certain forms of Hinduism, uh, you will see that they agree with this completely, that uh, the universe is just an image. So is our body, by the way. Our body is just an image. And when, so when you talk about moving from one world to another, bringing your body with you, you're not actually bringing the body. You're bringing the image of the body. The comp you're, you're moving through just pure consciousness, but you're bringing the image. And when you get there, you reestablish the image and step into it. You know, this sounds outrageous, I know, but you know what I'm talking about deep inside of yourself. You've all done this before. This is not anything new. Every single last person on earth has done this before. And you know exactly how to do it. When you find yourself into the movement of this, uh, this movement of spirit and consciousness to other levels of existence, uh, it's going to be so familiar. You're going to know exactly what you're doing. Uh, and, and believe me, there's no reason for fear over any of this stuff. Uh, it's all fine. Uh, and every last person on earth is going to be fine. Um, uh, I, I know people are worried. They're worried about their children. They're worried about their family and, and their lovers and husbands and wives and everything. But really, life is, is immortal. Every last person on earth is already immortal. And so we don't have to be concerned. But I know that we are so deeply embedded into polarity consciousness that it's hard for us to not go into fear and think that maybe uh, this is the end or it's over with. But it is not over with. If you, if you believe me at all or have any connection to me, you know, or to within yourself, which is even better, uh, there's nothing to worry about here. This is something that is beautiful that's about to occur. And if people really understood the nature of what was about to happen, we would be excited. We'd be having a big party right now because we would know that we're about to go to another level of existence where life is going to be easier, more beautiful, more fulfilling. Uh, there will be no sickness, there will be no uh, death, there will be no problems in the ways that we are creating them here. It will be very easy and expand very quickly. So I hope that, Keith, I hope that helps you. Um, this is a, another question from Daniela, and I'm sorry, but you didn't say where you're from, so I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, she was asking about the Mayan codices, and are they going to be revealed to us? Well, uh, yes, I believe they are. They're, it's in the process of happening. Uh, the Mayan codices, uh, there have only been three codices ever discovered uh, on Earth, uh, in modern times until just recently. Uh, when the Spanish conquistadors came through and, and uh, basically uh, tried to eliminate uh, the, the Mayans, uh, they destroyed almost everything. They destroyed all of their records, their temples, just practically everything that they could find. They, they got rid of them. But, uh, and so all, all that was left over were three. One of these is in uh, the British Museum, I believe. One is in Spain, and I think one is in Germany. And, and that is all the real, the, a, cod a codex or is, is, a, is a Mayan, is a book, is what it is. And, but it's usually just images and without words. And, uh, and uh, these books are uh, the only thing that we have left. But recently, uh, through the Itzamayan Council of Elders in the Yucatan, 
uh, one of their members, a man named Huns Batsman, uh, came up to me about a year ago and they had discovered two more codices and, uh, and he brought one of these up to show me. It was very, very interesting because uh, it was kind of like an accordion where you would unfold it out like that. It was all one piece and then it was written on one side and the other side and there were 13 pages that would unfold. And uh, there's been a controversy in uh, the Mayan culture between uh, the Guatemalan uh, Council of Elders and the, and the uh, Yucatan, the Itzamayan Council of Elders. The Itzamayan Council has been stating all along that the Mayans were into crystal skulls and into preserving knowledge through them. Uh, they, they, they're actually very much like computers, to that, the way we use them. And, uh, and the Guatemalan Mayans have been saying that, no, uh, we have never been involved in, in crystal skulls. And, but that um, controversy is over now, forever, because uh, as Hoons Batsman showed me this uh, uh, codex, which has now been uh, carbon dated to about 1300 and has been uh, authenticated by at least two universities, which is necessary to make it authentic, um, it shows right on there on the very first page, it shows uh, these Mayans, these ancient Mayans back to about 1300, doing ceremony and in their hands they're holding five crystal skulls. And so uh, we now know for certain that the Mayans uh, were involved in the crystal skulls. Well, that's, that is information that we have now, uh, has been delivered to us from the, the codices. That, that codex by the name is called the Wind Call and, uh, and will slowly come out into the, into the knowledge of the world. Uh, after that, uh, just a few weeks after that, uh, someone came to me personally and, uh, and who was a treasure hunter and they had discovered seven more codices. And, uh, and those seven codices have been, at least six of those codices anyway, have been photographed and have now been uh, returned to the Mayans and, uh, and which they're now uh, working with those things to understand exactly what knowledge that is. That was 450 pages. That was more uh, pages than all the five codices in the entire world. But uh, the excitement around that is that these, it was kind of like hitting the pin head perfectly. It, it, the, in these uh, seven codices, was the knowledge of how, exactly how, to go from the third to the fourth dimension. And it was something that they were missing and really, really needed. And so, as you can see, their knowledge is returning to them. Now we have discovered, in a museum in Los Angeles, in their basement, hidden away from the whole world, that there's over 1,000 codices, Mayan codices, and they are ancient. They have been uh, uh, carbon dated and they have been uh, authenticated and so we know they're sitting there and we are in the process of trying to get these. This has not been easy uh, because uh, the museum does not want to uh, reveal these for some reason. And so uh, we've been working for several months trying to find a way to do this. Uh, if there's somebody out there that has uh, any way to help us, uh, especially with funding, uh, that would be very, very good. We can get it so that you can give us this money through uh, a nonprofit because this whole procedure will be not for profit. We're not going to do this to make money. That's not in our hearts to do that. So uh, those are some of the questions and, uh, and uh, next time perhaps we will go on with more of these questions. I think we're, gonna, we're setting this up so we do this every Wednesday and we'll just continue to ask your questions. What I'd really like you to do is to give us uh, your question over Skype or some other uh, me method that we can see your face, see you talking, giving us the question, and, uh, and that way we can put it on the screen behind me here so the whole world can see you, and, and I think it'd be more interesting. So uh, please, in the future, if you can, give it to me visually. Okay, thank you guys. I love you very much. Bye-bye.